Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something new you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This past week, I discovered the art of Juby Henderson in our Southern Artist Showcase. Uh, he carved birds and also painted birds. And the coolest thing about him is he was bedridden for many years and still still did this in his free time. That is a very good intro to today's topic. Um, he was an outsider, self-taught artist. Um, and uh, it, it's really interesting um, to see the work that he did with the zero training. And, you know, I'm really excited. Uh, that exhibit, Zach, when does that exhibit close? How long do people have to see it? I believe until August 11th. Way to go. August yes, 11th, sir. 2024. So everybody needs to come check that out. It's free with park admission and membership. Speaking of outsider self-taught artists, I guess it wasn't self-taught, but speaking of outsider artists, um, our guest today is very, very special, Randall Kendrick. Randall is a native of Brownsville, Tennessee, about an hour and, and a little bit more from here. He has directed and produced a documentary about a massive metal structure, artwork, I don't know, we're going to talk about what to call it in a minute, in Brownsville, known as the Mind Field, not the Mind Field, the Mind Field. Welcome, Randall. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you guys for having me on. I'm happy to be here. First of all, congratulations. I attended the the big opening event in Brownsville that Sonia put on. Um, well attended. Uh, I wondered before I went, I thought, I wonder how many people in Brownsville, you know, even even, you know, consider it art and want to go to an opening. Of, I mean, it was it was full. So kudos on that. Um, I'm thank really you. excited for you. Great, great job. I loved every minute of it. And as soon oh, as I thank left, you. I, I texted Sonia and said, hey, I got to get him on uh, Real Foot Forward so he can share with us. So, um, but first of all, let's talk about you. Um, tell us about you, how you grew up, where you grew up, uh, the the steps that uh, led you towards being a documentarian. Um, so as I explained um, in the opening narration for the movie, um, I was born in Brownsville. Uh, my family, or at least my father's side of the family is from Brownsville. You know, my grandfather actually has his own special little place in the uh the bicentennial brownsville newspaper they released in the past month because he was like famous for uh logging with horses the old-fashioned way uh but anyway so so my family has roots in brownsville and i lived there until i was about uh 13 um and then we moved to you know a nearby city jackson um and um we only visited Brownsville occasionally to visit family and whatnot. And I didn't really go back and, you know, uh, really ruminate there until I was an adult and I was working and for work, I had to go down to Brownsville for a few weeks. And that's when I basically rediscovered the minefield, you know, as a kid, um, I, um, that was my phone ringing. Sorry. No, I, I always forget to forward it. But we don't cut anything out here. We just let it roll. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, yeah. No, no problem, man. Um, so, um, you know, as a kid, I I didn't know what the minefield was. The only reason I didn't think it was an electrical substation was because my mother knew who Billy Tripp was, and she did not like him. <laughs> um, so uh, I knew somebody had made it, but a bit, as a kid, you don't think too much about it. Uh, all you know is that it was this unusual thing somebody made. Um, and then, of course, uh, as a teenager, I developed a love for movies. Um, and that led to me in college. I majored in journalism, but I minored in film. I would have majored in film had it been an option at the time. Um, but um, so I took photography classes, editing classes, some videography classes. Um, and then, I, you know, I was working this regular job and I rediscovered the minefield as an adult. And it just hit me at the time that it needed to hit me, you know, at, at that time, I just felt like I, I wasn't going anywhere in life and I wanted to pursue what I really wanted to do, which was make movies, but I didn't know how to do it. And then here was the minefield, this incredible sculpture, this incredible piece of art 
where the person who made it literally took what was around him, which was scrap metal, actual garbage, and turned it into something larger than life and something that is hugely inspirational to me. And so that was an inspiration to me to you know, just think I need to do this. Like I, I need to do something. And it just made me infatuated with the sculpture. I started looking into the sculpture and trying to find everything about it uh, that I could online. Um, I found out that Billy Tripp had books about his life. So I started buying those and reading those. I found out about uh, Ken Heron's um, drone event, the Mindfield meet. And I just so happened to find out about it like a month before it happened. So I RSVP'd. I showed up when it happened. Um, I met Ken Heron and I said, hey, you know, I'm I'm originally from Brownsville. I, I would like to make a documentary and meet Billy Tripp. Um, and um, then he introduced me to Billy. Uh, me and Billy had like a half hour talk um, where... I basically told him who I am and what my background was. And, you know, he was iffy on it at first, but he was open to it because um, my family was from Brownsville. You know, I wasn't some kind of outsider Hollywood person coming in to examine his sculpture as some kind of circus attraction. Um, he could tell I was serious about it because I was reading his books, which not a lot of people do. Um, and that meant a lot to him. Um, and so uh, those two things, he was like, well, I don't know, but I'm all the open to it. So for the next few months after that, that was in August of 2021. So you so showed next, up. You showed up. I'm assuming with no camera or anything. Just no, you, no. Talking to him. Yeah, because I didn't want to. I was curious uh, because he's not like a guy who is really uh, open to lots mm -hmm. of attention. Or so yeah. I was really curious about. So I'm glad you're telling us it's the process of you getting him to warm up to the idea. Right. Of a documentary. Yeah, no, I didn't I didn't approach him with any recording recording equipment whatsoever. I knew that would be rude. I already knew he was a very um reclusive person who didn't like a lot of attention. So I I felt like that that you know that, that wasn't even a a consideration in my mind to approach him with the camera. Um but um so for the next few months after that, I was reading his books um and in preparation to sort of know everything I could about him and the sculpture. Now, quick um, question: as you're as you're you know exploring the idea of whether this makes any sense or not, um, well, first of all, Zach, have you ever been to the minefield in Brownsville? I have not. Okay, so um, were you running into people who knew about it, or were most people uh, you know like your parents? Or I mean, like, you know, you know, grow but... up when you're from a small town. And, you know, you have friends and family who uh, travel the same areas. Most people that I personally knew that I told about it knew what it was, or at least was were familiar with Brownsville enough to say, I, I think I've seen that, you know. Uh, so um, I do think it's funny that there are people, a lot, probably a lot of people in Brownsville who have grown up around that. And don't realize how unusual it is to have that right there in the middle of your downtown, right. um, because it is. We'll describe it for people in, more in just a minute, but it is an unusual thing to be there. But when you grow up around something like that, you don't realize how unusual it is. Right. No. And that that was definitely my case, as I said. Um, and like you said, it's in an unusual place, which just makes it even more inspiring, because uh, to me, that says that uh, there's no limit. There's no geographical limit on art. Uh you know, industry likes to centralize, you know, we think when we think of movies, we think of Hollywood or we, you know, we think of uh, Broadway, you know, we think of New York, you know, different art industries have their centralization. Right. But to me, the mind field is a testament to uh, the boundless nature of creativity and the fact that anybody can create anything uh, with what's in their heart and what's around them. But, but you know what? Also, I would also say kudos to the uh, county, city, whoever, all the commissioners, the leadership that didn't say, let's tear that eyesore down immediately and try to come up with ways to stop it. Right. Instead of allowing it to continue uh, to grow because it didn't start off being a celebrated piece of artwork that people that art folks around the country know of and talk about and, and which will absolutely someone 
uh, that night mentioned the night of the opening mentioned that it is absolutely going to be a huge tourist attraction. And right. so, you know, it didn't start off that way. So kudos to them for allowing the freedom for it to be created. Yeah, no, absolutely. When it was first created, and I mentioned this in the documentary, uh, but the city put a stop work order on it and was like, what are you doing? Are you building a building like you don't have a permit? And Billy was just kind of like, oh, I'm just messing around. You know, yeah. I mean, everyone already knew him as like the guy who, you know, previous to that made paintings, wrote uh, poetry, uh, made smaller metal sculptures already. And he's like, oh, well, I'm just messing around. You know, I'm just making stuff. You know, in my backyard, basically. And they're like, and basically their response was, okay, well, I guess that's harmless. Just let them keep going on. And, and so and let's that's go just ahead how and it was. share with people how he came to own that land that is right there, literally in, in downtown Brownsville, right next to Main Street um, through his family. Right. Well, it was his father's land. Um, I don't know if he had purchased it or if he had acquired it uh, through his father, uh, but it was basically an unused little field. And Billy was using it to store. Um, he had made smaller metal sculptures and uh, eventually he got his hands on some structural beams. And his original idea was, well, I'm going to put up these beams and I'm going to decorate the beams with my smaller sculpture. But then it just grew and grew into what it is today, which is like probably longer than a football field at this point. So, <laughs> right. And tall. It, I mean, in the you talk about how tall it is. How tall is it? I can't. Remember. Uh, it's like one hundred and thirty feet. Wow. If I, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very you know, tall. Um, and it is it is uh, um, impossible really to describe. But but you you have had to now in promoting the documentary describe it to a lot of different people. How do you describe it to folks who don't know what it is? If you've never seen the minefield before and you're listening to this, I would I would encourage you just to Google uh, the minefield, Brownsville, Tennessee. You'll find plenty of pictures of it. Um, but if I were just to describe it uh, from a audio standpoint, uh, it would be that structurally speaking, from the front, it kind of looks like a cathedral. And from the side, it kind of looks like a ship, which was intentional. Uh, but it is uh, basically made of scrap metal and scrapped um, metal um, structures. So the front is a lot of, uh, structural beams, a lot of augers, um, and a lot of his smaller sculptures that decorate it. Um, there's, there, there's, yeah, a, there's, there's banners hanging down Barbie dolls. Yeah. Once you get towards the middle, there's, uh, fire towers, there's like uh, silos, there's uh, two water towers, one being super huge that he dismantled from to Kentucky all by himself and then brought to Tennessee and put it all back up. Uh, he recently added a, a windmill, um, a wood chip burner, uh, a cell phone tower. Um, and so it is uh, it is definitely a one of a kind uh, structure. As you said, there's like there's uh, steel boats in it. That's one of the big themes of the minefield is, uh, you know, a ship, it being a ship. Um, and, you know, uh, because of the assemblage art nature of it, uh, at a first glance, it's kind of easy to uh, kind of not pay any real attention. But the more you look at it, the more you see real artistic intent and in how each piece was uh either assembled or reassembled and modified to fit the overall sculpture um i mean uh like there's banners with text uh that basically have his mantras for living life um there's uh different references to his books which you you know won't know unless you've read them uh but there's different texts there's different odd things in the sculpture that you're just like why is that there like there's a random chair there's a random bathtub and you know you just kind of come to realize that this sculpture is basically a giant metal diary of his life this is a, a chronicling of his life uh but if you look into it you realize it's also uh, a homage to his uh late parents um it is also where he is going to be buried when he is when he dies he has permission to be buried in the grounds underneath the sculpture. 
Um, and it's also a contemplation on life and death. There's a lot of very explicit symbols of death, skulls and life hearts. Um, and, uh, it sort of reflects his belief of the symbiotic nature of the two, uh, that the two are intertwined. You know, he puts it that, uh, there's a little bit of life and death and a little bit of death in life. And, you know, the whole sculpture just kind of reflects that as, you know, all of these metal pieces that came 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 from what you would might call dead structures and you know he gave them new life and then he's constantly building it as the old pieces are you know aging and decaying and you know paint chipping away so it is you know the more you look into it the more you think about uh what's there uh, the more beautiful and complex the image of the sculpture becomes um and it really is uh, a one of a kind um art environment, you know, out, outsider art project. And uh, I do truly feel privileged and honored to have been able to uh, document it in the way I have. Because as I said, um, it was kind of slow start getting him to agree to it. Well, that but was going to be my next question. So, yeah. so when we last talked about that part, he had said he would consider it. So mm -hmm. uh, what happened next? Basically, um, I was kept reading his books. And uh, he knew I didn't have all of his books. So one day he came by my uh, where I stay, you know, uh, my home, and uh, he gave me the rest of the books for free. And at that point, he had thought about it enough. He was like, I'm, I'm in your corner. I'm rooting for you. Whatever you need, I'm going to help you. Wow. And so uh, about a month after that, I had finished reading his books um, and my first interview was with Anthony Turner and I started interviewing people. And I uh, got him to agree to an interview. And uh, that interview happened in the beginning of January 2022. It was like three and a half hours long in total. Like, I don't even think maybe 10% of it was used in the documentary. There was so much. Wow. But um, after that interview, um, he was totally sold on doing the movie with me. Um, so I kept interviewing people until the end of February because he doesn't work on the minefield in the winter months. So I wasn't missing out on anything during that time. Let's shout out some of the other people yeah. that are included in the documentary that you interview. Uh, so Beth Tripp uh, is in the documentary. David Livingston, the mayor of and, Haywood and County. Beth, Beth is his wife. Yeah, Beth is his wife. She's also a retired psychologist. And she also gave a great interview. So important to uh, the narrative of, of the film. And, you and know, she's, our, giving... she's also our Haywood County historian. Yes. Uh, she was uh, the niece of the Haywood County um, historian, uh, Shaw uh, uh, Brooks. What was his name? I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, the historian, uh, Lynn Shaw, that's it, Lynn. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually have a bunch of his books that I bought in a in an auction one time. So a uh, really fascinating guy. And uh, she's really just absolutely wonderful as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have them, uh, Anthony Turner, who at the time, uh, you know, uh, had a barbershop and museum in front of the minefield. Um, he does not anymore, uh, but he's in the movie. And I think you had Hayden Hooper um, on there. And that was interesting to me because there was a, a bit of her from a, a shot, a shoot that was done, you know, a while back. And then you got her now talking about uh, the perception of locals, which I think is really mm -hmm. important. Right. Yeah. No, that uh, so Billy had actually self-funded his own little short film documentary, I want to say in the late 2000s, early 2010s. And so that's where that original footage is from. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got the opportunity, I got her contact info. You know, obviously I interviewed her again because her story is really fantastic and sort of indicative of a lot of people who are fans of the minefield now and that they didn't understand it. They kind of didn't like it until they opened up to its meaning and how it was constructed and why it was constructed. And now they just think it's one of the best things ever. And so, uh, you know, when, once I had the opportunity to interview her, um, I absolutely did because like you said, she was very emblematic of the public perception of the sculpture and how that changed over time.
But then you also interviewed some people on the street who were just like, I don't know. It's always been there. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, and that's most people in Brownsville. Uh, most as as Hayden Hooper says in the documentary, most people are just trying to live their life. You know, uh, they they don't have time to sit there and gawk at, you know, some unusual side on the side of the road. Uh, they just kind of glance at it, you know, assume something about it or don't think about it at all and just go on about their life. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, the majority of the responses I got when I went up to people in the street. However, one thing that's not in the documentary, and I really wish it was, was all of the urban legends about Billy Tripp, because I'm sure you're aware, um, because Billy is reclusive and he, he doesn't, um, socialize a lot. He's not super public. Uh, people just kind of assume things about him based on what he's doing. Uh, obviously because of the Satan saves thing on the back of his truck, which I don't think we've mentioned on the podcast yet, but at one time he had Satan saves on the back of his truck. Uh, you know, people assumed he was a Satanist. I've talked to many people who thought that he was, and this is the one that I did get on camera, but I didn't include it in the movie because I couldn't get anyone else to say anything similar. Uh, was so, I talked to someone who thought he was a Vietnam war vet and that he was doing what he was doing because he was trying to process his PTSD. And I, <laughs> it's funny because I actually tried to tell the guy otherwise. I was like, well, actually, I've read his books. And like by the time he graduated high school, the Vietnam War was over. And he was like, no, no, like he wouldn't hear it. Um, <laughs> and there's other people who believe that he is on drugs, that he turned to drugs and became a drug addict, either that or lost his mind after the death of a family member um so there's all kinds of theories floating around about him and that's one thing that i wish was in the documentary but it's very hard to get that stuff on camera because most people uh if you tell them hey i'm making a documentary about this thing if that's what they think about it th they probably don't want to say like <laughs> they, they probably right. don't want to be involved so I, I i didn't really get any of that on camera save for one person but if if i you know, had a time machine and could go back and, you know, bend reality to my will that I'd get that footage and that would be in there because uh, it's it's truly bizarre how many urban legends uh, have popped up around the sculpture and around Billy Tripp. Uh, Do you think you were able to capture more about this because you are from West Tennessee than if you were some hotshot from L.A.? Absolutely. And that, as I said, that's the only reason I was able to do it. Billy explicitly told me, you know, as we got into filming that had I not been from Brownsville specifically, uh, he, he would have said no. Um, so like I said, I'm very fortunate to have been in the position, um, that I was, that I was able to do it because, um, you know, uh, part of my urgency in making something about it was, uh, that I just, you know, it had been around all my life and no one's ever made anything about it. And the likelihood that someone is, you know, some actual big studio is going to make something uh, before Billy dies is probably pretty slim. And if they do do it after he dies, they're going to be picking up pieces. You know, they're, they're, they're not going to know where to start or where to begin. So I just thought I would try, you know, uh, I was like, oh, I've got a, I've got the minimum amount of education to try to try this, you know, the minimum amount of experience. I feel confident enough to at least give it a shot. So, so let's let's just go up to him and ask about him and uh, yeah, a ask him and see what he thinks. And um, so it was important to me that it happened because, you know, there were certain things like, for example, early documentation of the minefield that was very difficult to get. Um, uh, Billy had originally filmed and photographed himself building it for the first 10 years, but he had a shop fire that destroyed all of that. And so uh, we were under the impression there was no early pictures of the first few years of the minefield, uh, but he gave me a box of slides uh, and he didn't know everything in the box. He just gave it to me. It was just like, just look through these. If there's anything you want to use, you can use it. And in that box, I found uh, pictures from 1990. So the oldest surviving pictures of the minefield that uh, Billy thought had been completely lost. And those are in the documentary. So that's just one example of like something I was able to obtain because the artist was still living and um, because I was able to work with the artist that, you know, 20, 30 years from now, if someone else was doing it, uh, they may have not, you know, that that may have been completely lost to time. You know, you just never know.
Now, there's also an, an outsider artist documentary within your outsider artist documentary with the gentleman who has the barbershop that's right in front of uh, the minefield and has created his own little museum and his own little tiny exhibit. I thought that yes. was fascinating. It, it, it really was uh, when it was up, unfortunately. Um, uh, he, for reasons I won't get into for the sake of his privacy, uh, decided to uh, quit that museum and that barbershop business. But at the time when it was up, uh, it was an absolutely fascinating uh, museum that you could walk into and it was completely free. He only accepted donations. Um, and, you know, I had some documentation of it in the film, but I it, I really didn't do it justice of how much he crammed into that small space and how much there was to look at. Uh, there was another... Um, team who did a short little tv episode on the minefield and him and his uh museum um i think it was on a show called the unseen world or something mm -hmm. so i would encourage people to check that out as well if they want further documentation of um anthony's barbershop and museum when it was open um because it, it like you said it was just a really incredible fascinating thing and like the minefield it was very uh put together out of uh you know, almost a collage of different things that well, meant something to Anthony. He also, um, because uh, next to that at one point was an actual car wash. And that's yes. how uh, Billy also generated some revenue. But this guy had yes. taken pieces of the car wash and created like his own little mini outdoor. Yeah, like a garden right beside the steel garden. <laughs> yeah, so, really um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, no, he, he owned and operated that car wash at the time as well, but yeah, you're right. Billy did uh, operate that car wash for quite some time. And that was one of his main sources of income. Uh, now, you know, his, his father passed away about 20 years ago. Um, and so now he has rental properties and he inherited from his father and that's, uh, you know, what he makes money from. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, that, that was a very fascinating barbershop and museum. Um, I do hate that it's not around anymore, but, uh, the people renting out the building now, um, they, they run a school of music and I've met them and they're fantastic. So, oh, that's awesome. You know, obviously Billy owns the land and the building. Um, so he, he gave it to some great people who were doing some great things down in Haywood County. So, well, I do know that, um, as the minefield continues to be known there and it continues to be a draw, there's going to be a need for more of the story and interpretation of the story in a museum setting. So mm -hmm. um, I anticipate that that uh, will continue, um, which brings me to, to another aspect of it that I thought was really smart. The way you opened it up with representatives from the Kohler Foundation talking to Billy about what's going to happen to it to the minefield after he's no longer here mm -hmm. um, and the fact that such an esteemed organization um, is uh, interested in this is is also really cool talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that um so the Kohler Foundation um, has uh, made an agreement to Billy uh, to uh, preserve his sculpture after his death they're a nonprofit organization um you know they're temporary custodians and they find permanent custodians who will take care of um art environments that are left to them um and so the movie like you said it opens uh with them having a meeting with billy and discussing his will and the plans for the sculpture and the rest of his art uh after his death or retirement um and that's kind of significant because um, anyone who knows the minefield or knows Billy knows that for a long time, he said, well, I'm just going to make this forever. I'm going to make it basically till I drop dead until I literally physically can't. Uh, but now, you know, the opening of the movie, if you know anything about him, um, it's significant because he's making preparations basically re to retire and he's putting a specific number and saying, uh, well, by about 75, I'm probably going to quit. And, you know, then you guys are going to have this thing. And what are you going to do with it? You know, and you mentioned museum. Uh, you know, I know Kohler and Billy have discussed ideas. You know, obviously nothing's concrete right now. Uh, but if any museum were to open, it would probably be established after Billy's retirement. 
Um, you know, as, as you see in the documentary, he's got a ton of sculptures and paintings, um, just like hanging around his shop, hanging around his, his home. bike. His, yeah. His, his bikes that he, he yeah. Did. Now, uh, I, I don't know if you caught it in the documentary, but he actually stripped his bike down the main one. Um, that was like super, you know, attracted a lot of attention. He stripped that one down because he just kind of felt done with it. Uh, but yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, uh, he does have some other bikes that are decorated and could be housed in a museum as well. Of course, um, being in the museum business, like I was watching everything through the uh, uh, framework of a museum exhibit. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. oh, that would have been a perfect thing to have behind ropes. You know, oh that's... yeah, uh, well, it's not behind ropes right now. It's usually just behind a tarpaulin, <laughs> right? <laughs> or just right. like sitting, sitting underneath like a kitchen sink or something. Um, he he just has different pieces of his art stored in different places. It's like you know, uh, a lot of like a book he was working on burned, and he just like keeps that in a drawer somewhere. You know, the charred remains of it. Um, so yeah, he's a very sentimental person with uh, things that he makes and things that people give him like that. He keeps he keeps things around. Uh, but any yeah, any museum efforts will probably be after his retirement. Um, and uh, per what you see in the film, his wishes are for everything to be kept together. So if you want to uh, see any of Billy's art after his retirement, you'll have to come to Brownsville, Tennessee. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I want to talk with you more about the process of how somebody uh, does a documentary. All right. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at LeadersCU.com. Leaders is insured by the NCUA. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Randall Kendrick, director and producer of The Steel Garden, a documentary. So... Um, where we left off, you were telling us all about the minefield and, and ha the documentary that you've produced. Talk to me a little bit about um, how does one get started producing a documentary? You've got this great topic that, and you're inspired and you have all the passion. Um, how did you figure out how to get that passion from your head and your heart onto film? <laughs> I, I'm not really sure how to answer that because, uh, as as I said, it was just something I decided to do out of a sense of urgency, out of a sense of it. I felt like it was the right place and the right time in my life, um, and I felt like if I didn't do it, uh, didn't do it, then you know it it possibly would never happen. Um, and as far as uh, the nuts and bolts of making it, I mean, I just took what I had, like. I the, the camera that I use to film it is not really a video camera. It was a photography camera. It's, it was like a Canon Rebel something or other. Um, and I used one of those in, in college to shoot like my photography projects. Um, and so that's what I had. Um, and so I used that and like microphones, cheap microphones that I bought off Amazon, which constantly broke and was constantly an issue during uh, filming it. Um and, you know, I shot some of it on my phone. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was basically, as I said before, the, the schedule was first interviews. Then, you know, I filmed Billy for the five months. And, you know, I was working a day job while this was happening. So uh, Monday through Friday, I would work. And at night, I would, you know, do whatever work I could at home on the movie. And on the weekends, uh, I would go to Brownsville, go to the minefield, um, and film Billy for six to eight hours and, um, then come home and, you know, do it all, do it all over again until, until it was done. And like I said, I just had what was at my disposal. I didn't have a budget. I was just a person. And I said, I, I want to do this. And I just used what little disposable income that I had, which wasn't a lot, especially considering, uh, the further along the movie got, 
uh, like at that time, gas prices were like $5 a gallon or something <laughs> crazy like that. And so I was spending a bunch of gas and it was just really eating it up into my pocket. So I didn't really have any money or a budget and um, really no help to speak of either on a production level. Obviously, I'm very thankful to everyone who uh, participated in the documentary and made it possible in that way. But on a, on a production level, I basically did everything myself. Um, out yeah, of necessity, were, I noticed. I noticed little times in the in some of the filming where masks were visible, where people and I noticed some people sitting far apart, and I thought, ah, that's filming yeah. in the COVID era. Yeah, is it said? I you know I, I started filming it in 2021, and so Billy, being the age that he is, uh, 66 at the time, you know, 60, 68 now. You know, he's he obviously concerned with catching that. And so uh, basically the entire time we filmed, if there was anyone other than me, uh, you know, at the location with him, we would all wear masks. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's a bit of a time capsule there that dates the movie, but in a good way, I think. Um, uh, but, yeah, uh, to, to answer your question, uh, I just kind of flew by the seat of my pants, kind of, you know, I just had what I uh, what I already had. And then I bought what I could buy. Um, I did what I could with the time that I was allotted and the money that I was allotted. Um, and as I said before, um, due to the college classes I had taken, um, in the subject, I felt comfortable enough, uh, to try it. Um, you know, and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, if, if you want to get into the specifics of the actual filmmaking, you know, putting things in focus or framing things or whatever, um, I don't know if I want to get into all that because that gets, you know, very technical. I will say that I had a lot of audio issues throughout filming. Uh, the interview you see with Billy was actually recorded uh, from my microphone, but the source was from his phone. Because <laughs> the audio device that I was going to use to hook up to the microphone, I dropped it and it broke. And, and and so I was just I distraught and I was like, I'm so sorry, I, I'm going to have to come back, I guess. And he was like, no, wait, you know, can you plug it into my phone? And so then we started looking for, you know, adapters for an, his iPhone, found one. I came back and yeah, that that audio is from his phone. Like it's from my microphone, but it's from his phone. Um, and then, like I said, uh I had a microphone go out on me. Ironically, on the day the Kohler Foundation visited, if you wondered why uh, the movie starts the way it does, where like the audio cuts out pretty soon and I start talking, it's because there's almost no audio from that day, <laughs> except for when they were sitting in the room talking, because that that was just terrible when my microphone, you know, just stopped working on that day. Um, you know, and just different issues like that. Uh, going back to the camera, because it wasn't a... Um, video camera the camera when it was recording a video would shut off every 12 minutes <laughs> so, oh. and so literally every 10 minutes or so i would have to stop recording and start start another recording like oh, it, i i just had a lot of stuff to to work around and it, it made it difficult but you know i i shot it and uh i, I, I somehow organized all of it and got it all together so, so um, kudos, you did an awesome job. So when um when did you first show it to uh Billy? So Billy may have been the first person to ever watch it uh, because I got it done and I basically let everyone involved and all my friends and family know it was done. And uh, I was planning a test screening, which was just immediate friends and family and then like friends of their friends if they wanted to bring anybody it only ended up being like maybe two or three dozen people uh and we had it at somebody's house um before that i had given billy um a hard drive with the finished movie um and all of the raw footage because the way i figured is if i had any consistent partner in making it it was him um, so he, you know, owns the footage just as much as I do. So I gave him a, a hard drive full of the raw footage and the movie. And, uh, initially his thought was, I'm not going to watch it until you get accepted into a film festival. That's the <laughs> experience I want to have. But having that temptation there in front of him, he cracked and, and he watched it. And I do believe he watched it before I had that test screening. Um, so he may have been the first person to ever see it. 
um, which did he give you any I'm notes glad. at all? Any notes? Oh no, it's he had he had nothing, uh, nothing to critique. He was so happy with it, and I'm I'm happy he was happy with it. You know, if I had made that thing and he walked away from it saying, "Man." I messed up. You weren't the guy, man. I would well, have. Oh, uh, that 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 would have. That uh, words words cannot describe to how how much that would have broken me. So the fact that he loved it and the fact that he basically approved of at every decision I made in the movie, uh, meant everything to me. So uh, I'm I'm glad that he was the first person to see it, and I'm glad that he loved it so much. I mean, he's not somebody who really watches movies. Uh, he watches movies every once in a blue moon. And then, like of those movies he watches, he never rewatches anything, right? Uh, he watched my movie, and then like he would rewatch it and text me after he rewatched it, and he re he must have watched it like four or five times within the span of a few months. Oh, like I, I was so, I was so happy that that he loved it, that he loved it that much. So yeah, no, yeah, you he's did, seen it many times. It. You did get it into uh some film festivals, right? It was I did. I, I submitted to quite a few. Um but you know when you're a first time filmmaker with no <laughs> no budget, it's not an impressive resume. Uh I didn't get into most of them, but I did get into a few. I got into the Hub City Film Festival in Jackson, where it won Best Documentary, audience choice for best documentary. Um, which was that was that was a great experience. Um, uh, the Q and A there was uh, excellent. Everyone was super into it. Uh, and uh, you know, out of all the documentaries that showed there, mine was the one that uh, everyone kept talking about. So uh, I was very, very, very happy with the response it got there. Um, and then it also played in California at the Ca California Capitol international documentary film festival um much much bigger festival so i had much much more competition but i was just happy to just to be there and once again the audience there was just so enthralled with the subject and enthralled with the movie and had so many questions i stayed like an hour and a half after the screening uh talking to college and students and stuff who wanted to do uh presentations on it you know for their class and stuff it was it, that was a great experience as well uh that screening um and then of course we had this most recent screening in brownsville which um you know i uh collaborated with sonia to get that off the ground and she did such an excellent job preparing that and uh promoting that and you know as you said huge turnout absolutely huge turnout uh might be the biggest turnout for any any screening that the movie has had the one in jackson had a pretty big turnout too but i mean brownsville really showed up for their their special screening of it and i'm i'm happy because i wanted to make sure before it was released online uh that the movie had its its special time in brownsville yeah so I, I um i watch almost nothing but documentaries um mm -hmm. and it was i'm telling you it was fantastic i absolutely i was curious what it was going to be like when i when i went and I, I could not have loved it more um so folks who are listening hopefully we've generated some some people who want to watch it for themselves where can they go see it um, so the movie is going to be releasing online next weekend on, uh, March 9th. Yes. March 9th. Uh, it'll be releasing on YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that I've had, uh, since I was in college called Randall the Vandal, and that's where I'll be uploading it. Um, and, uh, you'll on that channel already, you'll find, uh, stuff related to the movie trailers, obviously. Uh, but there was an announcement video I uploaded, uh, when I first basically publicly announced to everybody that I was making it, uh, people really loved that because it was basically its own short film. Um, and then I also have, as I mentioned before, Billy has books. Uh, his first book is a fictional autobiography that tends to be a head scratcher for people. So I also have a guide um, to that book, how to, how to read it, how to interpret it. Um, and going over the whole story. So that's available as well. And then one of on my, March one 9th, of, um One of my biggest flexes is that he gave me a set of his books that were autographed. And so... Oh, that's great. I, I have them in a special section of my office where, you know, they're they're uh, one of my prized possessions. So yeah. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I've, I've got... Because I did the documentary with him, 
uh, his most recent books, I have like work print copies where like they weren't the official copy. They have like a band going around on this, like, you know, uh, it says like tentative, you know, do not copy or whatever. So that's, you know, uh, that's cool. It, it makes him feel special. <laughs> yeah. Oh, know? absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I also, yeah, he's a fascinating guy. And, you know, um, as you and I were talking earlier before we started the, started the record button, um, my wife as an art historian and we lived in Washington DC and we, and people would recognize Brownsville and Billy Chip and the minefield is, is a topic that artists in other cities are well aware of. So having a documentary like this, that will just further people's awareness of this as a piece of art, as a legitimate uh, piece of art is just such a great thing that you've done. So I'm well, really excited you. for people to see it. We will put links to all that in the show notes and on our landing page on our website, we'll also put pictures of the minefield so folks can go on there and actually see what we're talking about a little bit better. Um, and if I can find mine, we'll use my photos. So we'll have the okay. clear awesome. permission. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If so, you if you need any photos, I'll be happy to send you some of the awesome. minefield. You know, Thank just you. just yeah, just ahead, ask. Go ahead and send us a few, and we'll pop them absolutely. On too, so uh, so people will be able to see those as well. Um, now, what is next for you? Uh, well, um, I don't like going into specifics of a project uh, when it's first starting, uh, but something has started. Uh, I am making something else. I'm I'm trying to make another documentary. Um, and um, it has some similarities to my last one, to, to the Steel Garden, um, in that, you know, it's about someone who's, uh, or a group of people, you know, uh, the subject is creative in nature, uh, a little bit on the outskirts of acceptability. They're a little controversial, just like Billy was. Um, and uh, that's all I'll say for now. Uh, because, you know, I didn't publicly announce the steel garden until I was five months into filming it. And I'll probably be the same way here, uh, just because you never know what's going to happen, you know, things, things shift and whatnot, but I am working on, uh, something I'm very excited about it. Uh, the subject that I'm filming is also very excited about it. And, uh, I think it'll also be, uh, very good. So that's coming down the pipeline. You know, hopefully I'll have that done within a year or two, but I'm, uh, depending on what happens with it, I'm open open to this filming process taking more than a year if need be. So, nothing set in stone yet, but I am working on uh, something that I think is very exciting. Have you got new equipment? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was the first thing I did before I, before I started filming any of this new uh this new film uh i i bought a camera that's actually made for videos <laughs> it's awesome. no more shutting off after 12 minutes yeah, um great. you know i got got better lighting so I, i've got better better equipment now so the movie's gonna look better uh and i won't have as many um production issues hopefully uh so yeah I, i'm very excited about the new project i apologize for being vague but like i said that's just how i am i don't like to uh, show my hands too early in the game that that makes it even better you've teased it just enough that we'll have you back on when you have your next project done well thank you um and I, you know first of all i want to thank you for uh the documentary because i believe as a person whose roots are in haywood county i really believe this is an important work and i think this is really going to bring some attention to it so thank you for that and then also thank you for being on our podcast you are so welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. If I would, if I could do one more plug, just to say, uh, uh, in case it isn't clear, the title of my movie is The Still Garden. It will be online next Saturday, uh, March 9th, on my YouTube channel, Randall the Vandal. I will also be releasing it via torrent, uh, and that will come with exclusive content. So if you know how to do that, awesome. Uh, you'll get a uh, tons of extra stuff uh, for your extra effort that you put in to download the movie. Um, and if you don't know how to torrent, that's okay, because shortly after the release of my movie, I will be uploading a YouTube video called Hi How to Pirate My Movie. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys all enjoyed The Steel Garden when it comes out next week. And um, Mr. Scott, Mr. Zach, thank you so much for having me on. Fantastic. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.